Hello everybody and welcome back to the next episode of my Successful Entrepreneurs Stories series. It's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend Stuart Norris to you today. Now he is the founder of a company called Magic Memories and I'm guessing that many, many, many of you have actually uh, used this company or, or had services from this company without actually knowing it. So Magic Memories is the company that photographs uh, you when you're having adventure experiences. So for instance, if you in London have been to the London Zoo, the London Aquarium or Harrods, uh, the Barcelona Football Club, the Sydney Opera House in Australia or even Movie World and Sea World in Australia, in South Africa Table Mountain, um, soon in America, uh, in Orlando I think it is, the home of Disney, and in New Zealand, all the AJ Hackett uh, adventure outlets and the shot over jet, among many, many others, you, your, you would have been photographed by Stuart's company and you would have had those beautiful um, memories um, that, that they would have created for you. So I'm delighted to welcome my friend Stuart to uh, talk to us today and to share his story of, of the business that he created some 20 years ago. So Stuart, hello, welcome. Hello, Adele, and thank you very much. That's a very flattering entry. <laughs> well, I'm just so delighted to um, be speaking with you and to have you share your story because I know you've been in the business 20 years and at present you have 120 sites in nine countries and you're employing a 1,000 people. Now, that's a massive um, business by anyone's standards. So how about you start by telling our listeners how you became an entrepreneur and um, how you got the business to, to the scale it is today. Okay, well, I, I think really that the idea of becoming an entrepreneur isn't a, a sudden moment in time. I was always interested in the way businesses worked, and I knew, uh, for instance, when I did my degree in, in business, I thought that was something that interested me. But my very first venture was uh, to start a record label when I was 14 called No Brain Records, um, which we, uh, my brother was the musician. And he was the first um, first act ever to play the St Albans Abbey during assembly. Uh, we, we pressed 500 singles, and I organised the financing of it through a local T-shirt manufacturer. Um, so that was my first ever um, operation, if you like. And, and did, and, did you uh, sell anything? Um, I've got about 200 under my bed, but um, most, most of them sold. And my brother went on to become a, a quite a famous uh, musician, so uh, it was just it was the first scene. But it, it, it was an enjoyable moment, and it was just trying to um, create something out of nothing, which was which was uh, part of I think the entrepreneurial spirit which I which I possess. Mm. So, how did you come to found uh, Magic Memories? Well, my um, a friend of mine had, had opened a. Um, uh, Mexican restaurant in Queenstown and uh, and I went out with her one night to design the wine list for her second restaurant but she told me her story and her story was there's a boat in uh, Queenstown called the Urns Law and so she photographed the Urns Law in the day and then served a table at uh, the Mexican restaurant at night and after one year she bought the Mexican restaurant so it seemed like quite a profitable business um, so my dream while I was in Queenstown, New Zealand, was to open up a business. And so um, I came up with the concept of going to the Skyline Gondola, um, taking the photographs at the bottom of the gondola. People alight to the top to have dinner. We would whiz down the chemist, make the photos, and bring them back straight away, which was a completely novel experience 20 years ago, mm -hmm. where the competition would just let people wait two or three days, where we, uh, we appreciated that we needed to market it immediately and sell to them immediately. And my dream for it was to start a business with a dollar. So that's what we did. The, the, the investment, capital investment in the business was one dollar. Um, and then we used sponsorship through American Express, who gave us $5,000 um, in order to brand their product. So we promised American Express we would put their branding in every, every tourist's uh, hand that came down from the gondola. Whether they bought or not was, was our, our um, exercise, but everybody was aware of that, that brand. And we arranged with AGFA to uh, provide us with um, $10,000 worth of um, a, a photographic uh, paper and chemicals and film um, so that we could uh, start our business with, with our dollar. Amazing. So I must tell our listeners that you are English, 
Yes. And somehow you got to New Zealand. You founded the business in Queenstown, New Zealand, like you said, and now you yep. live in Australia because yes. you uh, expanded the operation and, and, and grew it in Australia. So you're very international. It's lovely. So, so tell me um, about some of the early business challenges and fears you faced in getting Magic Memories up and running. I'm guessing starting with a dollar and now being the size that you are, there's been a, a fantastic journey. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the early business challenge is we didn't actually know if anybody wanted it. So um, we, 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 we gauged the marketplace. We, uh, we, we understood the need for a, a immediate supply. We understood the, the market. Um, and, but, you know, we hadn't recruited before. We hadn't employed people before. So fundamentally, um, both my business partner and I were working in a full-time job. One of the earliest challenges was to say to, to one of us, if this is going to work, one of us is going to have to jump. And then shortly afterwards, the other would have to jump. So I actually jumped from a, from a pay of employment to this operation. And so in order to do so, um, we had, you know, that was, that was really the, the, the moment where we had to commit to the business. Um, and so work, I worked, you know, 70, 80 days straight. Um, just getting the feel of the business, getting systems involved, and, and, and luckily we, we launched just at the uh, end of summer, so there were some good, you know, good numbers coming through, and we and we worked out a business model that actually satisfied that uh, that, that demand, and luckily um, in in those days our margin was something like um, ninety something percent, so um, there was there was there was a good, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to sell that many to keep going, so that was quite nice. Wow, every entrepreneur's dream and ninety percent margin. Wow. Yeah, and the other one, of the other one, of the other things as well is our business is a cash positive business. So the fact that everybody buys the product there and then, there's, there's no there's no long term debt. Um, so we we could we could quite simply um, we called it an anchor draft. Um, we, we we basically paid our, our, our suppliers sort of um, we 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 made very good terms with all our suppliers and explained to them the seasonality of our business. And so we paid on the nineteenth of the month for everybody who expected the payment on the 20th. So we stuck out that Magic Memories, oh, Magic Memories are paid, Magic Memories are paid. So we created this environment that Magic Memories are good for the money, you can trust us, we're fantastic. And then in the three months that nobody comes and we're actually sitting there just waiting for someone to arrive, mm -hmm. we could actually have the relationship with the supplier and explain to them that you know, we have zero cash flow this month, mm -hmm. um, that, but that's where we are. So to build up that cash flow, because of the seasonality of our business, and particularly in Queenstown, there are very two very distinct po um, um, busy periods, but there are basically um, May, June, and um, October, November, are very, very quiet times. So we had to make sure that the, uh, our supplier base understood the seasonality of our business. Mm, fantastic. So how did you scale the business? Clearly you worked out a business model, um, but you are massive yeah. now. So how, how did you do that? Well, I mean, it, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. So, so incrementally we, we grew, immediately having provided a very, very good service for the customer that they weren't expecting. Other um, attractions around uh, New Zealand heard about us and wanted some immediate solutions for their customers rather than two or three days later. So, so just by word of mouth and by being very careful to say that we are not exclusive to anybody, we will, we will service everybody as if they're our only customer, um, we actually grew our business within New Zealand. Um, and then after a, a, a few years, we got to a situation where we were the biggest player in town and we had sort of, you know, plus 50% of the, of the entire market. Just uh, in, in Queenstown, we, just in Queenstown. Uh, in, 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 in Queenstown and then, it, then going on to all of New Zealand. Yes. Right. And so we had to make a decision. What do we do now? Um, and at that point, we decided that we needed to surround ourselves with some talented people to steer us because all we've done up to this point is just run a, a duplicatable business but in, in, in a home market. Uh, and so we relied heavily on some external advice. We um, attracted a chair. We created a board. Uh, we got a very good chairman on board who had some very good international knowledge. And we came up with an international strategy. And we felt that Australia was the most logical step because it's it's you know it's in a similar time zone, and so we very 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 hard decided after that twelfth year of business to attack the Australian market. Uh, and in doing so, I went to live in Australia, um, and then we first of all cornered Sydney as a cluster, and then as as a consequence of that, we went to the main centres, and that's how our business expanded into Australia. But very importantly. We had some fantastic supply and some advice from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, and they were really, really helpful in our entry strategies and working out how we had to think. Because, to be perfectly frank, 
New Zealand and Australia have great differences. They have great similarities in language, but they have great differences in the way people think and operate in business. And so in effect, what we had to do is we had to, when we were in New Zealand, we were wearing an all black jumper. But when we came to Australia, we had to put the, uh, the wallaby jumper on and, and act and think and feel like Australians in order to make our business work. So for instance, for our uh, Victoria, um, people, they had to find out, uh, they had to support an AFL team, they had to know what, what you know, what the, the, the in intricacies of the winery region in Victoria and understand how business is done in Victoria, because it's very different from Sydney and it's very different from Brisbane. These are subtleties, but we had to actually uh, totally submerge ourselves in each environment in order to get create um, traction. We did that very, very quickly, and then um, we stumbled across an opportunity to, um, to come over to the uh, this UK. Um, through a, a, a Ferris wheel company, and we followed them. And so, my poor um, then two-year-old son had to up and up sticks, and, and we then went to um, the UK and set up the UK operation. Wow! So, your market must be competitive. I'm, I'm guessing. What stands you apart from other players in your market? Um, I think really it's um, a, a, a strategy and a philosophy of the whole business is we make people smile. It's really, really important to understand uh, uh, the needs of our customer to actually, uh, the customer may not necessarily know what they want, but we can come up with the concept of what we believe they want, and as long as we then pressure test it to make sure that, that we are actually right and be nimble enough to innovate and change constantly is a really, really key part of our service. So we know, we know our, our sweet spot. We know an ideal customer, an uh, ideal client who is an attraction that has, uh, is indoor, it's open every day, it uh, takes about an hour and a half for people to go through. It's basically called a midway attraction um, and our service fits perfectly into that environment. We've got, we always remember we are a guest of our attraction and so anything that we do has to be fully uh, agreed by, uh, with, our, with our guest attraction. So for instance in Edinburgh Castle, uh, we actually wrote the script, what our staff had to say, because that was a key uh, uh, worry for them, as uh, allowing an outside contractor to photograph um, their customers. So we work nimbly with each of our attractions to make sure we're achieving what their goals are. Um, and so if we, we understand we've got an advocate in the business, we understand what they want to achieve from our, business, uh, our um, service, then we, we can go forward, because we are a fantastic word of mouth piece of marketing that actually gives our customers um, a revenue stream. Mm. So we hand the photo to someone, they go to their hotel, what did you do today? Or we went to the aquarium, look, this is us at the aquarium. Or each of our products tells a story of the attraction. And so we just we just focus on the customer, focus on the, um, the client and make sure that those two marry and just keep innovating to keep ahead of our competition. Mm. What are your own skills uh, in, in terms of what have you relied on most in your arsenal of, of ability to support the success of the business? I think, well, optimism is one of, <laughs> one of it. I, mean, I think, uh, you know, John and I are both marketers and we understand um, the way in which business works and we, 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 we can see the sweet spots of our, of our clients so that we, are, can, we can actually fit with what they, what they actually need to achieve. Beautifully, um, the, there was an actual demand by their by their customers for a photographic service. So, in the attraction industry, they, you know, they, we weren't actually preaching. We didn't need to convert our customers. We needed to explain what their solution was. Um, and I think I think just just having a, having an absolute belief in what we're going to do and making sure that what we actually promise we deliver um, and over deliver, and we also never stop trying to improve the relationship with our customer. So for instance, one of our promises to our, our client is it's year on year, we will give them, we will give them a better service, we'll give them a bigger, a bigger share, and uh, we will make them a better business. Mm, great. And John, your business partner, did, other than the marketing um, skill, does he have complementary skills to your own, or do you employ others with the complementary skills? 
It was interesting. Early on in the piece, we, we, we decided that we've got to be very careful that we didn't tread on each other's toes and, and be, be sort of joined by an umbilical cord. So uh, it, it was important for us to actually say, right, this is what I do, this is what you do. We did it geographically, but we did it, you know, I, I ran the financial figures because I think I, I, I can count to 10 and he can count to 8, but that, that was about it. So, uh, but we, we decided who did what. Uh, and very quickly, we, we decided that we, we are never, ever going to be afraid to employ people that are better than us. And I think that that, that allowed us to, to have a forward-looking vision into our business. So, you know, our CFO, our, our COOs, you know, all the people that we bring in are absolutely tremendous. Um, and we allow them to um, specialise in their area and we encourage them to grow and we empower them to do what they need to do. Obviously, then we steer them strategically, but, you know, I, there is no point to getting the, the founder to do the typing because he's the best typist, because that is a bad use of his time. We need to people to get into their skills and do the right things in the right place. Mm, well done. I wish more entrepreneurs would do that, actually. Um, Strong financial management and, and systems and processes must be incredibly key in your business. You've got so many people, you've got money changing hands, and in, in the early days I'm guessing you had a lot of cash changing hands, probably less so now with um, debit and credit card processing. Mm -hmm. What um, systems and processes uh, did you put in place in the early days and how have they carried you uh, to, to the way you do business today? Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the revenue is irrelevant. You, you've got to run a profitable business. You've got to make sure you have, uh, you've, you've dot your I's, you cross your T's. Um, so as a business, quite early on, we didn't even know what they were called at the time. We, we use what people loosely call now as key performance indicators to work out exactly how well our business is doing. Um, and so in effect, what we say is it, um, we do a, 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 a revenue per head figure is one of them. So it, it, we know if 100 people come into a certain site, we, we know an expected level of revenue. And so we can gauge our operation and whether we're working well or poorly against our expectation. And we monitor those on a daily basis throughout the business. So I know exactly how many photos yesterday were sold at Move You Up. Mm. And was, was cash management an issue to start with or did you just nail it from, from the start? Well, cash management is a constant, um, constant worry um, with regards to the, the um, security and the safety of cash because it literally is cash. One of the one of the realities is our product is a you know ten, twenty, thirty dollar uh, expense, and, it, and and even though you know people have got these um, these way, uh, pay wave cards over here now, so you you know you never even have to put in your pin number. There is still a lot of cash in our business, and so we have to be very careful uh, that we we manage the cash. We make sure there isn't any leakage. We make sure our staff for safe, we have procedures about you know what happens if somebody wants your money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it is very, very important to, to set those in place and be very open with our staff about you know what we're doing, how we're going to do it. Um, you know we've got a, a, a till system that's uh, throughout the world. We've got um, we've got cameras, we've got um, you know expected um, performance levels, we've got good stock control. So you know we have to as as we multiply in our sites, we have to basically use a, our formula. And, and, and locate it in the next next area, the next area, the next area. Obviously, there will be differences in, with, with regard to the um, countries, the wage rates, the, uh, the number of people you have to employ, uh, but fundamentally, it is a repeatable model. Mm, what are the key strategic goals uh, you have in place for your business, that, say, for the next two years? Um, our strategy at the moment is we're in a very, very fast growth strategy. Um, you'll hear about Magic Memories because we are making a, a lot of noise about what we're doing at the moment. Um, year on year for the last two years, we've had 50% growth. Uh, we expect that to continue. Um, we have a number of key partners who are growing as well, so we're holding out on our shirt tails and making sure that we can satisfy their demands. Um, but yes, we, we, within the next two years, I, I expect the, the size of the current business to triple. Are you at liberty to tell us what your turnover or profitability is in the business? Um, we're a we're a fifty million dollar business at the moment. Turnover. Yeah. Okay. So, do you have an exit strategy for the business? What we've what we've done is as as we as we've grown up within the business is we've brought on. Uh, a number of mentors. I, I mentioned earlier that we're never afraid to um, um, employ people better than us, and I think that is the best described in our board of directors. We have um, uh, a, a, 
our chairman launched a, uh, a satellite navigation product. He was the president of the, of the USA. Um, one of our board members has got massive retail experience throughout New Zealand, um, using, using to run the CEO of Eric Watson's companies. Um, we've got a guy in San Juan, a uh, new, new director called Craig Elliott in San Francisco, who uh, Steve Jobs bought him a Porsche when he was 23 to say thank you, and he's a serial entrepreneur. Um, we've got a very, very high, high uh, ranked tourism um, expert. And so our, our board is driving us to achieve our, our, our um, major goals in the next few years. And as a consequence of that, we have had a lot of people very keen to invest in our company. Um, we have diluted slightly into the investment, but we've got some really, really good people who are backing us. And those people will, will, are expecting growth expecting profitability and expecting return on the investment. So what that, what that a actual strategy is, is, is fluid. I mean, it, it, it could be a number of reasons. I mean, uh, it's fairly obvious which way we could get out. Uh, however, the, the reality is at the moment, the, the focus is on what is the best thing for the company. And we are operating in exactly into that extent. Um, just recently, for instance, we've had a, a, a big, a large level of equity investment into the business to grow the business. And our strategy at the moment is um, we're basically doing uh, research by acquisition. And so we're, we're seeing a company that we could use in our, in our next story, in our next innovation. We're going out and we're looking at them, we're buying with them, or we're merging with them in order to grow our business at an ever, ever increasing pace. Wow. It's very, very exciting. It is. Um, yeah. So what have been your biggest or most pleasurable successes in your business to date? Well, uh, yeah, I think well, um, getting the Prime Minister to open one of our sites was quite quite nice. Of which country um, are we talking here? <laughs> uh, so the New Zealand Prime Minister New opened John Key. At, at, John Key opened our London Aquarium site the same day that he went up to meet the Queen and to talk to her about um, whatever he talks to the Queen about. Um, so he, he so that was <laughs> golf. Yeah, um, that was that was fantastic. Um, um, we've got a, a, a in, in South Africa. We have a a program which we uh, actually take people out of out of the the ghetto basically and, and introduce them to our company. So us, with the, along with three other three other businesses, develop these very timid children, uh, your young people, and teach them business skills. And so, and throughout the course of the year. They are earning enough to keep ten, them and ten of their relatives um, alive, and these these kids are one one uh, generation away from aid. So it's 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 it's, it's a great community um, drawback. And some of the people we've got, I mean, I, I, I've got a guy who's worked for me in South Africa and Australia. Uh, he's currently in China. Um, and his, his growth has been fantastic. Some of our staff have been with us for 10, 11, 12 years, which is, which is fantastic. And we've, we've been al allowed them and enabled them to flourish in the way they go. Mm. Have you had any coaches or mentors to support you in the development of your business along the way? Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, from, from day I don't know, two, really. I mean, we've, 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 always, we've always had, a, had an, uh, an opinion that the business is only going to be as good as the people we can attract to it. And so um, we have to do two things. Number one, we have to attract some, some world-class experts. And, and secondly, we've got to keep up. So um, we've been mentored by a number of people throughout the years. I've got a mentor um, I, I, I speak constantly to in, um, in London. Um, and my attitude towards mentorship, it, it is a two-way street. You have to be able to give your mentor something back. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, but it's 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 really important to actually have that sort of even if you know, the, I think the best mentor conversation I ever had, the only word he said was hello. And what I'm saying is that by just having to present my thoughts in a logical, seasoned manner, it, the solution actually came out without the mentor actually saying anything. So it's just having that ability to have an open communication with the, with the mentors. But we've also got mentors within the business. Um, and so it's really important that, that as well as people driving us externally, we've actually got to listen to people within the business. And if it's a good enough idea, we will take it. Brilliant. What um, qualities, perhaps three of them, have held you in good stead and, and helped you in, in the growth of your business and your own personal growth in life? 
I, I mean, that's, that's the tricky one. I, mean, I, I think, you know, I think the, the I don't know, I don't, is, it, is it three or 300? I don't know. But I mean, the, I think what, it, what it's got to be is we must be able to communicate to our people the vision. And if we can get them on board, get them all pointing in the same direction, you know, the famous big arrow with all the arrows pointing within it, pointing in the same way. Mm -hmm. As long as we can communicate with our people, this is where we're heading, this is why we're doing it, come with us, because we are not afraid to change. We've actually been described as one of the companies that gets the fastest change that people have ever seen. So we've got to make sure that they understand the direction in which we're going and actually be able to communicate. So, the, so honest communication with the team, I think that the, the, um, another strength is, is actually the optimism or the enthusiasm for the product. Um, we've always thought that we've worked for a thing, an entity called Magic Memories. John and I have all, you know, from day one, it, the Magic Memories exists as a separate entity and it's our job to nurture it, to make it grow and to, to make sure that the, this entity is in its existence. We don't, we don't look at it as a pension, we don't look at it as, as oh, you know, how much money can we take out of it. The entity comes first and I think if we, we've had that very, very clear strategy, of, you know, we work for this environment and, it, and we cannot take the mickey out of it and we've got to respect what it can become and if we make it grow it will grow beautifully so I think the I think the idea of what I'm trying to say is that you know actually understanding the line between business and personal side is very very important mm. and based on your experience if you've had again three key pieces of advice to give a person growing a small business what would that advice be well the first one's fairly easy it's know your customer now this can be in a customer that is demanding and say, oh, I need a red one, a blue one, or a yellow one, and you can deliver it. Or you can think of a, a developing a product that you think your customer is going to like because you know the sort of things the customer likes. You then introduce it to the customer. You then have to pressure test it, make sure it is working, and then you have to change it if it isn't and always innovate it. So the, the, the knowledge of the customer, if you don't know what your ultimate customer wants, be it the supplier or um, be it the, uh, the, the person who's actually experienced the attraction, you're not going to go anywhere. So know the customer. And, and going back to a point I made earlier, the business is an actual entity. You work for that business. You cannot, you cannot. A lot of people I know, in, particularly in the startup mode, there is confusion between where they stop and the business starts, and it all seems to be slightly spaghetti. Mm -hmm. I believe yeah, for a successful entity to, to be able to prosper, it has to be able to stand on its own two legs. You have to feed it, you have to nurture it, and make it grow. And the other one is live your culture. Um, magic memories, we make people smile. And that is, that is, we make our customers smile, we make our shareholders smile, we make our staff smile, we make um, our bank smile. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that you, you live your culture and it's got to be real. It can't just, can't just be three words you know, tagged underneath the brand. It has to be a living, breathing document. So it, we, we actually look at, uh, we, we give out awesome awards within our organisation. Did we live the culture? Did we make people smile? Mm, brilliant. And finally, one last question. When you are in your advanced years, maybe 101 like I plan to be, <laughs> in, sitting in your rocking chair after a busy day at the office and having a bit of fun doing other things too, what will give you the greatest reason to smile about the life that's gone before you? I, I, just, think, I just think the idea of, of taking a back-of-the-envelope dollar business um, and with constant refinement, constant innovation, creating a, an entity that's affected hundreds of people's lives for, who work for us, thousands of people's lives with the, ser the service we've given, and just, just, just to have, have that sort of impact on people. I mean, you know, I, we haven't reinvented, uh, we haven't split an atom. You know, we are, we are a service industry to, 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 to give people a trophy memory and a story of their adventure. But one thing I remember very early on, it must be, it's probably in sort of month three of business, I was in a, um, a news agent and I saw somebody buying a frame, a photo frame, and I saw them put my photo that we'd taken into that frame mm -hmm. and, and that was going to be their memory of New Zealand. And the fact that we supplied that, that vehicle made me, made me smile. Brilliant. 
Stuart, your story is wonderful. It's so inspiring. A dollar business that's turned into a 50 million turnover business with massive growth growth um, on the horizon still. It, it's just fabulous. And I really do thank you for taking the time to share your story with uh, me and, and my listeners. And I am certain many of them will be uh, inspired and hopefully motivated to do and great things in, in their business too. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate thank your time you. today. Thank you very much. I love talking about my business. So it's fantastic. <laughs> and, it's easy. It's easy. And, and you can hear the smile as you speak. I, <laughs> I can't see you right now, but I can feel your smile and you're certainly living your culture, living your values. So well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.